So I'm uh, Randy Curran, University of Rochester. I'll just say very briefly, I was one of the people, the privilege of being in on the ground floor of this great venture. Um, I'm very, very concerned that there's been so little laughter at this event so far. I mean, even the brilliant Harry Brighaus barely got you laughing. I'm deeply concerned about this. Ethics is fun, right? Okay, so um, I'm gonna try to be serious some of the time. I'm gonna begin with a word of affirmation. I'm gonna go on to make a terrible confession for which I apologize to Mira in advance. I'm then going to tell you a very brief cautionary tale about the prospects of this great venture. <clears throat> and then I'm going to tell some very encouraging stories about the actual state of this venture, which may surprise and delight you. OK? So first of all, the word of affirmation relates to what Harry said. So I can't resist this because I've had the same experience that Harry's had repeatedly. So I began teaching courses in education ethics about 30 years ago at the University of Rochester. And I repeatedly, in my course evaluations, had students say, this is the only practical course I got in my entire degree. All the other courses I took were just theory. Well, what is a course in education ethics, if not a course in how to think carefully, deeply about your professional practice. The projects I had them do that dominated their work was to identify an ethical issue in their own professional practice. It's hard. It's hard to do that. So that's what we worked on. That's what we want them to be able to do. So that's the word of affirmation, the cautionary tale. No, the terrible confession. I was, I was ready to skip over the terrible confession. So uh, not all education ethics is, of course, ethics of teaching. I had personally, the one year I taught in schools in New Orleans, I had 40 students per class. So anyway, I heard the numbers 20 and 30, and, I, and my heart, I was envious. So anyway, so the terrible confession has to do with the fact that I have been a sort of um, uh, philosopher, administrator, king for way too many years. I am uh, stepping down after 19 years in the chair's office in June, a year early, because I insisted I was going to have to be done. So in the course of doing that, what I've learned is a lot of the decisions we make, and this is echoing uh, something said earlier today, is you, ha you have a workflow and you have to make decisions. And you have to make a lot of them very directly, immediately. But you have to have an extremely good sense of when you have to approach things more deliberatively uh, so they don't blow up in your face. And the, text, the books I taught, the things I taught in teaching education ethics were substantially, though not dominantly, um, stories of things going awry. And so I think of the whole enterprise here as partly teaching people um, to be mindful of what can happen if you, if you call things wrong in what to decide on the spot and what you have to approach more deliberatively. So the terrible confession is that one of the things I've done that's falling broadly within education ethics was I was instrumental in creating a, uh, an uh, ethical investment advisory committee at my university. So one of the ethical issues in higher education is students and others become very concerned about um, where the university endowment's being invested. We had no such committee. At the beginning, it was largely about fossil fuels. I worked with the university president, the Senate, and the student association that was bringing the pressure, and we created this. And the one thing, and this is a confession, I utterly failed 
in drafting the proposal to create this committee, I utterly failed to say there should be an education ethicist. There should be any kind of ethicist at all on this committee. It was a foregone conclusion that I would be on the committee, but I made no provision for a successor. Happily, we have a philosopher ethicist successor on the committee, but that was a failure for which now here, hearing Mira this morning, I feel bad. <laughs> Um, so, uh, so she's envisioning a world where we, where it's natural for us all to think, oh, I'll consult the education ethicist. There should be education ethicists, and I've fallen down on the job, at least in that respect. So, so that was the terrible confession. The cautionary tale is that if you look at biomedical ethics, and you go back to the 70s, one of the people who was a big name in that field was Baruch Brody, who was a philosopher at um, uh, a great college in Houston, at, uh, which Rice at Rice University. And the story about Baruch, sorry, thank you. The story about Baruch was that he got a phone call, or he got a request. Yeah, it was before email. He got a he got a, a request to give a talk at a at a, a medical school, and he didn't want to do it. And instead of saying no, he said, well, I'd do it for $2,000. He thought he was naming a sum so astronomically high. This was the 70s. But he thought he was naming a sum so astronomically high that there was, oh, no, sorry, we can't do that. And his heart leapt, or something, I don't know, his terror or delight when they said, OK, no problem. Right? And so money talked, and he became a very significant player in the field. So the, this is cautionary in the sense that we're trying to do something analogous without quite, without there being money in big hospitals where they're willing to spend money on ethics because they at least initially thought it would pay itself back in less in liability payouts. So that's cautionary, but I've got some encouraging things to say. I think there's actually more active consulting of philosopher ethicists in the world of education now than Mira let on. And so one, I was reminded of watching, and I want to thank Mira and all of you involved in organizing this. And I was reminded of this by watching the really skillful, low profile coming down the aisle with the water up here, staying below camera level. And I was reminded of the way uh, the monks served us when I was doing a live television broadcast with His Holiness the Dalai Lama in the summer of 2019. Now, why is this relevant? It's relevant because he was hosting a dozen of us, all philosopher ethicists, who were uh, engaged in the uh, possibly benighted uh, effort to, um, to bring an ethical concern and get it, lodge it um, successfully in the, in the world of global education policy. And the ambition supported by the Dalai Lama, hence the television broadcast with him, was to shift global education policy away from a posture of subordinating education to uh, uh, the economy. Right? So we've got what's dominating global education policy is the view that education is a secondary institution that is properly subordinate to economic relations. Right? That's a view of how that's on topic for this session. I'm just telling you something will be, and this, and this is it, right? Is, is that's a view of how Education and the ethics of education, in this case, the aims of education, sit with respect to the work of and life of other institutions. Right? It's a very old view that education is subordinate and, and either naturally subordinate or properly subordinate. It's often blurred over. Right? And so the ambition that has been emerging in global education policy is to abandon that, regard education 
as an institution that has its own purposes, that education is fundamentally about promoting favorable forms of development and learning. That's a simple conception of what education is. You can't get anywhere having a conception of what education ethics is. You can't demarcate education ethics without some conception of education. So there's a very simple one that I hope is reasonably uncontroversial. Education is an enterprise of promoting favorable development of individuals, favorable development and learning. Okay? Uh, we don't know yet what constitutes being favorable. Maybe being favorable is uh, building human capital in the bodies of our children. Maybe it's something for children that could also be of social benefit. Harry talked eloquently a few minutes ago about human flourishing, right, being what we would be regarding as favorable in what we would aim for in the formation of young people. There are two competing visions, but there are also two competing visions of how education is related to other institutions. So Dalai Lama, one prominent individual in the world who is putting some effort, some resources, some prestige behind a different vision from the one that's dominant. UNESCO has just invested uh, uh, a large proportion of its very meager but substantial resources right, in orchestrating 300, they call them scientists, but it included me, 300 researchers in developing uh, a set of reports on flourishing in education, where we stand, where we ought to be. So there were education ethicists, multiple ones, ones I've been working with, consulted by UNESCO, brought into this process. Education ethicists were consulted in both of these stories. Okay? The OECD is now consulted at least some education ethicists in a parallel effort. That's come about partly because we have 12 countries now rebelling, including Finland and Singapore, rebelling against the PISA, the PISA exams and what those exams are premised on, which is economic growth. Right? Templeton World Fund is doing the same thing. Templeton World Fund was represented here at a conference on flourishing and the measurement of flourishing in January. Okay? So philosopher ethicists, ethicists are being consulted right, in the highest levels of attempts to shift global education policy. So this is not a fantasy what Miera is trying to lead us in. It's actually happening. It's just not happening in a way where we yet have a field that's transparent to us and where we feel connected and like we're part of a common enterprise. So I'm a little bit ashamed of my failures, but I'm actually um, reasonably optimistic about this whole enterprise getting some traction. And so that said, um, I will stop. I'm going to be prepared to take really good notes. Um, I'll be happy if I... Anyway, so this is an almost all Harvard uh, panel. So I'm assuming these individuals are familiar to some of you. And um, we haven't prepped. I don't have paragraph long introductions. So forgive me, kind people. We will go in the order of the program. We will begin with Jarvis Givens, professor of education here in this school and also affiliate uh, faculty in the African and African American Studies program. We'll continue on to Jal Mehta, professor of education in this school, and then wrap up with Gina Shouten, professor in the philosophy department. Okay, all right, I will sit down, thank you. <clears throat> Uh, all right, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm excited to be here and to be able to be a part of this conversation. I've been um, hearing my good colleague, uh, Mira Livingston, talk about this work for some time, and I'm happy 
to be able to be on this wonderful panel and to share some thoughts um, about the, the work that's being done here from my perspective as a historian who writes about the history of black education. Um, and I'm gonna offer some, some, some reflections in terms of, um, some of some of the thoughts that came to mind for me in terms of what it means to kind of conceptualize a field of educational ethics um, in relationship to uh, my reading of the history of African American education and maybe some questions that for me emerge at that intersection. Um, and so to begin, I thought, you know, the first thing that came to mind for me is how does one register the history of African American teaching and learning in a field of educational ethics given that African American teaching and learning developed as criminal activity as early as the 18th century and to varying degrees through the greater part of the 20th century. As early as 1740, Colonial South Carolina passed a law to criminal, criminalize and suppress the education of African descended people and such laws proliferated in the United States, particularly the antebellum South, but they also appeared in other parts of the Atlantic world and among the five Native American tribes that enslaved African people. In 1819, the state of Virginia, for instance, passed an anti-literacy law to explicitly prohibit, quote, meetings or assemblages of slaves at any school or schoolhouse for teaching them reading or writing either in the day or night. End quote. The Virginia legislature revised this law in 1835 to also include the education of free African Americans in the state. Despite such prescriptions, however, black people developed a politics of education that deemed anti-literacy laws to be illegitimate. This engendered a countervailing vision of educational justice. They organized and acted accordingly. African Americans secretly held schools, exchanged lessons, stole newspapers and spelling books, they traded food in exchange for literacy lessons from poor white students, and they engaged in a wide range of fugitive means to catch a lesson, as some of them phrased it. This social history reveals that there was an ethical dilemma at the heart of black education from its inception. To develop liberatory models of teaching and learning, African Americans knowingly violated laws and law-like social customs. They acquired education by theft, stealing opportunities to assert themselves as more than physical beings, as a people with equal capacity for mental development and spiritual striving. And several narratives of formerly enslaved people come to mind when thinking about this conundrum. Many of them have written about their experiences as fugitive learners. In their autobiographical writings, formerly enslaved people often outline that in order to acquire a meaningful education, they had to break the law. What's more, to put their education to good use in service of the anti-slavery movement or even the everyday needs of their local communities, educated black people and black educational leaders transgress laws and social customs that explicitly condemned and criminalized their actions. To pursue meaningful education, they were forced to operate outside the bounds of ethical codes widely accepted and upheld in the broader social context. William Sanders Scarborough, for instance, offers one such narrative. Born enslaved in 1852 in Macon, Georgia, Scarborough began his education under his mother's tutelage, herself having learned to read and write in black-run clandestine schools in Savannah, Georgia as Georgia had established its anti-literacy law as early as 1780. Learning as much as he could from his parents, Scarborough eventually began lessons with free black people who were educated and willing to take the risk of tutoring him. And he wrote the following of his secret scholastic endeavors. I did not parade my efforts, however, as I daily went out ostensibly to play with my book, Concealed but really as time went on to receive further instruction from free, colored, from free colored friends who helped me on. This learning was soon put to practical use. He states, I was often called upon by friends and families to write permits. Without these, a colored man would have been punished for the misdemeanor of visiting his family. My conscience has never troubled me for rendering this assistance, 
though I would not recommend as good ethical training such continued practice by a boy for any length of time. However, all of us then felt justified in it because of the system under which we were forced to live. Scarborough knowingly violated the law to continue his education, but he also used his literacy to forge passes to men, for men in abroad marriages. These were men who would have been owned by one master and their wife and children by another, or a wife who may have been free and her husband enslaved and vice versa. Aware that his literacy acts were illegal, Scarborough explained that his conscience never troubled him because he and his family operated from a different set of ethics. Their vision of justice was one beyond the bounds of the law, especially given how the same laws made it permissible for he and his family to be the property of another. Again, the lesson here is not only about the act of secretly reading and writing. Of greater importance is the alternative set of ethics by which Scarborough, his family and teachers lived in the world, ethics he understood to be decidedly against those imposed by the dominant society. For them, justice was fugitive. A countervailing vision of righteousness and fairness engendered among those who have been systematically unprotected and violated by formal laws and practices. They maintained a split dual consciousness, one imposed from without and accountable to white laws, the other being an alternative way of seeing and knowing that grew out of their dreams and desires as a persecuted people. This history of black fugitive life and education was about more than secretly learning to read and write. It also meant developing a lens of critical literacy, counter readings of what was good and true in the world, even if it was at odds with dominant legal procedure and protocols of schooling. And such subversive practices would persist after slavery was abolished, even as black education became technically legal. Formerly enslaved people and their radical Republican allies wrote universal tax-supported education into Southern constitutions for the first time, benefiting both, poor, both black people and poor white Southerners. Yet black education continued to be met by violent white resistance. For example, between 1866 and 1876, more than 630 African-American schools were burned down across the Southern states. And because of aggressive structural neglect by white school authorities, the majority of black students would not have access to public high schools until after the mid-1930s. Such an oppressive context meant that black teachers and students would continue to embody a fugitive disposition given their shared vulnerability. William Scarborough became a college professor and authored a popular 19th century Greek textbook, yet he would be excluded from various professional academic associations, such as the American Philolo Philological Association, in humiliating fashion. Like Scarborough, African-American educators and students were collectively subjected to various forms of anti-black exclusion and confinement in American education. And such violation of black people's humanity manifested through racist curricula and educational practices informed by the racial ideologies of the time. Black people resisted and worked to model alternative visions of educational justice, and many of them were punished for doing so. For instance, in 1925, the white school board in Muskogee, Oklahoma, which was heavily influenced by the Ku Klux Klan, learned that Carter G. Woodson's textbooks, The Negro in Our History, was being used in the local black high school. The local school board confiscated this book about black life and culture. The teachers were reprimanded, and the principal was threatened with his life and forced to resign. And examples of this kind of violent oversight are plentiful. Black teachers were routinely targeted and fired for challenging white authority. Some notable examples being Ida B. Wells, who was fired in Tennessee, in the 1890s after exposing the exploitation of black women teachers by white uh, male educational administrators, but also John W. Davison, who was fired from a school he founded in the early uh, 20th century, not for teaching uh, black life and culture, but for teaching, continuing to teach Latin after he was permitted, uh, 
after he was forbidden for, um, from doing so, but also Anna Julia Cooper, who was demoted as the principal of the M Street School for her uh, disagreements with local white educational authorities, but also Septima Clark, who was fired in South Carolina for her involvement in the NAACP. And yet, I think it's important to note that there were some teachers who lost more than their jobs. Harry and Harriet Moore were fired in 1946 after their efforts to advocate for salary, salary equalization for black teachers, um, but then later killed when their home was bombed in Mims, Florida, after they engaged in local organizing work for the wrongful accusal of a group of black boys for raping a white woman. Black educators walked a tightrope when challenging such oppressive schooling context, because if they were to fall or be caught, there was no safety net to catch them. A purposeful education for black people has required a steady practice of escape. In doing so, African-American people, like many persecuted groups, developed an ethical vision of the world among themselves internally. Theirs was often set apart from the ethical code of those in power. So just to kind of close, um, I had a quote from Carter G. Woodson, but I can say this during the Q&A, but I just want to close by saying that I believe that a close reading of the history of African-American education prompts us to ask the following question. How might we account for educational ethics from below? And of what value are they to a field of educational ethics as a whole? And relatedly, how might we account for a plurality of educational ethics from below, given that the diverse histories and experiences of marginalized people have led to competing visions of justice? Thanks. Ciao. Um, thanks, Jarvis. Randy, I'm just going to talk from here. There we go. Um, great to see everyone. Uh, very much um, looking forward to being part of this panel. <coughs> um, so I wanted to start by um, taking some credit for the founding of this uh, field. Uh, I, I wasn't here this morning. Mira, did you already give me credit? No, no, no. Uh, Mira, you should definitely take credit yourself while you have a chance. Mira and I uh, used to, as we were coming up for tenure, we would uh, have lunches uh, weekly. And the purpose of the lunch was just to take a little bit of time out from all of the various people who were putting claims on our time and just you know, spend one session a week just talking about our own work. And we would alternate. One week it would be my week, and one week it would be Mira's week. And in Mira's week, she would just be overflowing with uh, <laughs> possibilities and ideas. Uh, one I remember is a potential book on why teaching is interesting, which I think would have been good. Um, there were always like new classes to be taught, institutes to be founded, et cetera, et cetera. And somewhere in the mix of all of those ideas, she was like, you know, I think like like bioethics, there should be a field like like eth eth ed ethics. And so like week after week, I would say, do do that one. That's that's the one you want. Uh, <laughs> And so um, if there are any historians here you know, trying to uh, track the launching of the field, they should you know, revisit the meeting notes of those uh, lunches, because that's, that's where I start. Um, in all seriousness, um, I do really believe in this project. I think that um, ethics should be a field. There are clearly many ethical uh, dilemmas in education for which there may not be right or wrong answers, but there are better and worse ways of thinking about these things. And, uh, educators should have those frames or repertoires as they approach those situations. Okay, so what can I add, other than what I've already added, uh, to this, <laughs> to this uh, field? I'm, uh, I'm not a philosopher, I'm a sociologist. Uh, I did my early work in the sociology of the professions, and more recently, uh, I've been studying practice, like what practice looks like at a really close level. So I wanted to talk from those two lenses, sociology of professions and sociology of practice. So from the point of view of um, professions, my first book uh, argued that education, at least in the United States, had failed to fully crystallize uh, as a profession, and that a lot of the more specific problems that we see in education are a consequence of trying to fix through policy what should have been developed through a profession. So if you're trying to 
um, assure quality in the fine-grained work of classroom teaching, you don't want to do that from Washington or Beacon Hill. You want to do that through training controlled by members of the guild and those sorts of processes. And I think a big part of all professions, Howard I'm sure will talk about this in his session later this afternoon, is that they, um, there's not just a, a commitment to quality, there's also a moral commitment, a Hippocratic oath, a sense that, uh, that there is an exchange between the society and the profession. And the exchange is you as a profession are going to do something good for society. And in return, we're going to give you some ability to self-regulate uh, your sphere. Um, and so in that sense, professionalization is about making situated judgments, drawing on evidence, and oriented towards values in context, in ways that are good for the client and the society. And so making ethical judgments is a big part of that. And I would think that the way that ed ethics would need to proceed is to move iteratively in a similar way, I think, to the way that uh, law develops between particular situations and broader principles. As new situations arise, those principles get tested and Gradually, you know, more and more principles get applied, and you start thinking about in what situations do what principles apply, uh, and so forth. So I wanted to make three points, and the first one is that I think ed ethics is a necessary part of the professionalization project. Um, so my second uh, point or question is, um, what sort of field uh, should it be? And uh, I've started to answer that. Uh, I think as a lot of people who are interested in practice and philosophy uh, have stated, Aristotle's idea of phrenesis or practical wisdom is the sort of right uh, notion that uh, we're not looking for uh, sort of huge truths with a capital T. We're looking for uh, applying particular truths to particular situations with particular judgments uh, of context. Um, I think um, the... The question I have about this set of things is that the notion of phrenesis brings together the, the ethical, the normative, and the philosophical with the empirical and consequential. So in other words, um, the way that if we think back to the great sociologists upon which my, who, uh, who founded my field, uh, Durkheim, Marx, uh, Dewey, Du Bois, Adam Smith, et cetera, those were folks who uh, had uh, studied the empirical world and reached conclusions about that, but did so in ways that were greatly infused by their uh, varying ideals. And then what happened in the academy is that we, we bifurcated those things. And so we developed a whole sphere, sphere of social sciences starting about 130 years ago, and then we developed another sphere of uh, philosophy. And so I guess what I see as a possibility of this field is, is an opportunity to, to, re, uh, to reintegrate uh, those things. Uh, some of you may know a book by John Safier called The Skillful Teacher, which is uh, about this thick and shows you all the things you would need to think about to be an effective teacher. And I think rather than having a book on the skillful teacher and a book on the ethical teacher, we really should just have one book on the skillful ethical teacher. That part of being a skillful teacher is being uh, an ethical teacher and that those things uh, can and should uh, be integrated. Um, and then my third point is that um, better systems can preclude some ethical dilemmas. Better systems can preclude ethical dilemmas. So this is true at the classroom level in higher education. There's a lot of talk about uh, hot moments, what to do when someone says something that is difficult, challenging, or downright offensive in class. Uh, is that a microaggression or a macroaggression, or is it an instance of free speech, or should you focus on the collective or the individual or repair harm, or, 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 or? But usually what has happened in such a situation is that someone feels unrecognized, like they don't belong, like they're being excluded in some way from a dialogue, and so they just sort of like throw themselves in the middle as if to say, like, I'm here, you need to see 
uh, my point. And so if you, build, uh, if you build the right kind of classroom culture, if you build a brave space which recognizes students' identities but also recognizes that in an academic setting people are gonna be pushed and challenged and there's gonna be disagreement, if you build the right kind of space, then uh, you'll um, lessen the opportunities for sort of the in the moment uh, kind of things. And then if we think about K-12 education, I think this is also true at the system level. Uh, one of the first, maybe the first case in Mira's uh, oeuvre is this case uh, about Ada, who is an overage eighth grade student. And uh, there's a long dilemma about uh, whether she should be uh, promoted. Um, and uh, you know, we see the views of different teachers and um, if we, pr if we promote her, we're relaxing our standards. She's not really academically ready for the next grade. If we don't promote her, likely she's going to drop out. Um, and the schools that we might be able to promote her are painted in the scenario as like not that great schools who aren't gonna look out for her and bring her to uh, a flourishing uh, outcome. And so we could spend a lot of effort sort of ethically debating like should we promote her or not? But really like, somebody fell down on the job like long before we got to eighth grade. Uh, no one was looking out for her academic well-being, her social well-being, uh, and so forth. So um, in, uh, in a real world environment, um, questions of ed ethics are almost always gonna be questions of non-ideal theory. We're gonna be in scenarios where there's not enough, where there's too few resources, too little support, uh, too great ambitions, um, and that's gonna lead to a lot of impossible choices with no great answers. But we should strive to try to create a world where that is less the case, we're less faced with sort of downstream dilemmas and we've more built the kind of upstream kinds of systems that put people uh, in a better position. And I think a big part of building those uh, upstream solutions is uh, professionalizing the field with an ethical uh, integrated strand. Thank you. Fantastic. <laughs> Gina. <laughs> Thanks. I'm so happy to be on this panel. Uh, really enjoyed these contributions. A lot of what educational institutions like schools do is make up for the failures of other social institutions. I think that in a sense, this is as it should be. Given that those other social institutions are failing, schools should do what they can to take up the slack. But of course, in a different sense, this isn't as it should be at all. Other institutions shouldn't fail, so schools shouldn't have to take up the slack. Given that lots of kids don't get routine vision and hearing screening outside of schools, schools should do this work in-house. But schools shouldn't have to do this work in-house because in a decent society, labor markets and other social institutions would be arranged so that those with primary caregiving responsibilities for young children uh, would be able to take those kids to routine health checks without incurring very high costs, costs like losing a day to public transit or job loss or just a really grumpy boss. One of the guiding questions for this panel is, when and how is it appropriate to take the larger context for granted, as much as we may wish it were different, and figure out the ethical demands for educators, schools, and the education system within that context? And alternatively, when and how should we challenge or question the context itself in considering questions of educational ethics. I do normative philosophy. And in that context, I don't just want to know what's wrong with the status quo, I also want to know what should be done and by whom to make things better. So I'm primarily interested in asking about the demands of justice for educators, schools, and education systems holding fixed the injustice in other social institutions insofar as that injustice is unlikely to be ameliorated over the time horizon of the normative question I'm asking. In asking questions about educational justice then, I'm mostly interested in thinking about just educational institutions for an otherwise unjust world. 
What do such institutions look like and what responsibilities do individuals have to bring them about? I talk about this in terms of compensatory institutional obligations. Childhood poverty is absolutely unjust. And in a functioning institutional division of labor for justice, it wouldn't be up to schools to tackle childhood poverty. But we don't have that functioning institutional division of labor, so schools have compensatory institutional obligations. The extent and stringency of those obligations are important substantive questions. I happen to think they're quite extensive, but that's something for which I would owe you an argument. What I want to suggest now is just this. As educational ethicists, I think we should be principally focused on asking about educational institutions for a society that tolerates childhood poverty, because that's the society we have. But we, of course, also want to know what just educational institutions would look like within a functional institutional division of labor for realizing justice. Because I think compensatory institutional obligations are extensive, I think the answer to that question will be very different than the answer to the other question. I think just schools for a highly unjust society look much different than just schools within an otherwise just society. My point for now is just that we want to ask both kinds of questions so we can know what justice asks of us now with respect to educational institutions and so we can know what parts of what justice asks of us now are compensatory. What justice work schools ought to tackle only as a suboptimal remedial matter because other institutions are falling down on their part of the job. Like many of you, I teach a class on educational justice and I've noticed something. Many students are impatient with anything that seems to them like an idealization. So sometimes I'll try to isolate some variable so we can focus on it and try to figure out what moral difference, if any, it makes. Many students want to really be shown the value of doing that because of their impatience with idealization. They want to consider all the variables all at the same time. Anything less, they think, oversimplifies the problem. But these students often take issue with anyone posing what I just put forward as the kind of question educational ethics should principally be concerned with. Why should we take poverty for granted in asking about educational justice? That's incrementalism. That's acceding to injustice. Or why take it for granted that middle class social mores about respect and assertiveness pervade the workplace? Why take for granted that privileged parents will threaten exit from the public system? or that the public system won't suddenly enjoy a massive influx of new resources. I think these indignations are smart and productive. We should insist on holding conceptual space to cast moral judgment on the constraints within which we operate. But through conversation, we often also come to see that there's a tension here to be resolved. We can't both disdain idealization and insist on thinking about educational ethics for a society devoid of the injustices we despise, or as a project only of lamenting those injustices. And what many of these students come to notice is that it's much easier to lament the constraints within which educational institutions operate than it is to forward a defensible view about how educational institutions should navigate those constraints. I think we owe it to the victims of injustice to keep lamenting the constraints, to keep asking what moral judgments we ought to cast at those constraints, and to think hard about how ethically to navigate them. And my hunch is that the greater danger is not that we'll forget that poverty is unjust, but that we'll unwittingly use the injustice of poverty as an excuse not to ask the hard questions about compensatory work in education. Well. <laughs> Thank you, uh, all three of you. That was uh, very rich and interesting. And I'm, and I'm actually struck by how much you've actually addressed the official questions posed in the, I, went, I almost said syllabus, in the program for this, uh, for this session. I, I think I'd like to begin with the concept of ideal theory which, Jal, you used that, and Gina, you talked, um, you directly spoke to it, maybe without naming it. But since that is in, that is the concept of, of um, non-ideal theory, 
yeah, I think shaped the framing questions for this session. And since it has been named, maybe we should begin by just addressing for those here who are not steeped in the literature of political philosophy, um, political theory, what that means since it has come up and how, why it is relevant, how it is relevant here. Jolly, you want to begin? Because you, you used the term, you referred to it in your, your third point that you made. Sure. Um, I mean, I think it just picks up directly right where Gina <clears throat> left off, right? So, um, I, you know, ideal theory is thinking about how the overall institutions of society might be organized, which would include education, but also poverty, health care, um, and the basic distribution of social welfare and the, or, the structures which, um, which organize that. And then non-ideal theory is how does one make uh, decent um, ethical judgments in a world where we have not yet realized all of the um, aspirations of, uh, of ideal theory? So um, Gina, when you make your both and argument to, to students, how do, they, how do they respond? Well, I don't make the argument to them. <laughs> I think that's the first thing. So I think a lot of this, emerges out of actually their engagement with the cases. And um, so one thing that they do is they turn in two drafts of a kind of moral assessment of the case. And uh, in response to the first draft, I often find myself um, pointing out that what they've done is identified a lot of ways that, that um, someone could have done right by Ada a long time ago. And we could have avoided this whole mess. Um, so, so here I'm going to. I'm going to work towards saying that I don't think this distinction is helpful, this distinction between ideal and non-ideal theory. I think it, um, it's just kind of distracting. But um, in response to that, so my feedback on these drafts often takes the form of saying, um, you've, you've done this really great work of thinking about how we might have mitigated this problem or how somebody else could have done something to sort of make it not even arise. But there's someone in the classroom right now, and it has arisen. And so it's great. Keep thinking about all of those mitigation strategies. But we also have to navigate the dilemma. And I and this is kind of what I, and I think and and I this includes me. I think we're always we always want to go and reach towards the thing that could have been done to avoid this whole mess, uh, or the thing that could happen now to avoid this whole mess. And we should we should do that. I think it's it's right that we should do that. But we shouldn't only do that. Um, and I just think that there are the reason I think that the ideal, non-ideal distinction isn't helpful is because I don't really see anyone doing what philosophers refer to as ideal theory. There are just lots of different kinds of non-ideal questions. So we can ask, what actually should have happened for Ada? That's already a non-ideal question because Ada just wouldn't be Ada in a just society, right? She wouldn't have come with these challenges. Um, and we can ask, but given that they didn't do that then, what should we do for Ada now? And those are just two important questions in non-ideal thinking about normativity, and I think we should ask them both. And I just don't think we should get distracted by sort of this litigation of like, um, you know, what's ideal theory? You know, I think we can use the term idealization, and then what idealizations are helpful for us in asking this question? Um, when should we dispense with those idealizations? I think, um, and this is not to be critical of you, because I agree, like, we should be doing non-ideal theory. But I think um, often when I hear those terms, it's like kind of um, someone casting aspersions at ideal theory, and I just don't see who their opponent is, really. So that was great. That was great. And I want to, I want to, um, I want to ask this a little bit differently. For a lot of people in here have spent a lot of time around schools of education. I just have to put it out there. It doesn't say it about me, but I'm actually a professor of education too. I spent the first 17 years of my career half in a school of education. And so uh, the idea of ideal theory, the way we're talking about it up here and the way it's talked about in political philosophy is the idea that you frame a, a theory of political justice right, as a theory about what would be an ideally just system of governance. Or, and so you're focused on the whole, on the ground rules of the entire system, right? And so if you're doing, if you're addressing every question about social justice, um, in your, in, just in that mindset, you're limited, right, to saying, well, okay, well, what would be the role of schools 
in an ideally just political system. And, but we're, all, we're essentially never faced with that question in, in practice, right? So what we're, what we're struggling with in thinking about a field of education ethics is if we're a panel, imaginary panel of ethicists being called in to consult on the real questions about education that people face, what kinds, what is in our toolkit? And it can't just be what we're calling ideal theory because it's just not going to be directly applicable. So that's, that's the background here. We use the term non-ideal theory as a political theorist's way of talking about making real people making real decisions in the actual situation they're in um, within the body of professional and pr practical ethics. We just call that doing ethics, right? So, but I wanna tie this in with something related and that will connect to uh, Giles' reference to phrenesis. So, and I'm gonna get historical for a moment, but I promise it won't be for long. So my experience of schools of education is that there's a very common theory practice model. You, you come into an ed school and you're taught theories in the one I've been associated with, all the students now say that their job is to figure out each individual professor's favorite theory and then cast everything in the terms of that theory. So it's a theory, theory and practice. Their job, they think, is to think theoretically about everything. And so I'd have students coming to me with the most mind-bending proposals. They say, I want to work on tracking. I want to think about whether tracking is okay, and I want to approach this from a Heideggerian perspective. And so they're proposing to read Heidegger and then write, I don't know how many pages about Heidegger and then have a section that says implications for practice. And my view is that this is utterly, completely hopeless because it doesn't do the two essential things. And this is going to phrenesis. It's not articulating what the relevant values are or ethical considerations, and it's not articulating and defending what the relevant facts are. To make, a, to make an argument for what ought to be done, where we've been talking about should, 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 should up here, all the ethical questions, you cannot defend an answer to that kind of question without grounding it in ethical premises and in factual premises. That's the basic thing that has to be said. Right? And if it's guidance for a real decision in the actual world now, it's got to bring this together. The idea of phrenesis, as we find it in Aristotle, that's the history, is about people being educated systematically in ethics and systematically in the relevant bodies of fact and bringing them together in judgment. Right? So, so if we're beginning from there and we're trying to create this field, what should we be doing? What should we be doing to cultivate the kind of judgment and capacity to provide meaningful guidance on the kinds of questions we're concerned with? Any of you. I didn't say everything that has to be said. <laughs> Oh, no. Um, I can go. Um, I mean, I think one of the, um, Mira and I uh, share a student who is now a doctor, uh, Tatiana uh, Geron, and um, she wrote a dissertation about, um, about a number of these ethical dilemmas in practice. And, um, you know, one of, one of the things that came out of that was, you know, phrenesis is a very broad concept, and it's a, it's, a, it's a way of describing, it's a label for a realm of action. But, okay, like now you're in action, and, you know, you're trying to make a decision, and you're like, okay, I should be like looking to my practical wisdom. And I should, as Randy said, I should be considering the, the ethical dilemmas, the fact pattern, the context, the likely consequences, 
Um, I should be integrating all of those things. Okay, but like, could you give me like something else to hang on to other than, um, other than that? So I think there's a, a lot of, so in Tatiana's th thesis, for example, um, the question was like, well, let's say you're a street level bureaucrat and the people higher than you in the system have made a set of rules that you think are unjust and are not serving well your clients. Like what should you do under those circumstances and what should guide you? And she put forward uh, a set of criteria which were like, you know, looking at students' um, well-being holistically as opposed to just on the basis of their uh, text, uh, test scores, uh, act, acting uh, flexibly, and Tatiana, help, third. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and so like that is uh, giving you, it's starting to like give you some uh, purchase for um, what sort of dimensions of the question. So I guess I imagine as the field proceeds, we would start to name those dimensions and we would start to name which types of situations, which dimensions apply, which I think is the core of professionalization. Professionalization is uh, having a wide set of repertoires and knowing when to apply and what diagnostic criteria would allow you to know what to draw upon at what time and moment. And so that's sort of how I see it might, might be, how it might evolve. Jarvis, I, I, when I was listening to your contribution, I, I guess I was thinking, I mean, maybe part of the answer is that we um, need to have more engagement with the exemplars of phronesis. I mean, I was sort of, so Joel was just talking about like people operating within really <laughs> extreme constraints and facing very steep costs to doing yes. um, right by their students and to exercising this kind of judgment. Yeah, yeah. And I, I sort of feel like you gave us some cases of people who did that under the highest stakes. Yeah, I think that's been the history of black education. Um, but also, it also becomes a question of what the, I mean, I guess the larger question about the aims of education. And I don't necessarily know that there is a, these are also a set of educators who are operating, at least historically, in the tradition that I write about and that I'm thinking about both in the contemporary moment and then. You know, it's not only about things like, you know, um, the kind of development and flourishing of individuals. That's important, but it's also about a collective vision of struggle that is first and foremost as important before questions about subject matter, expertise, so on and so forth. Um, and I think, so, you know, for many of the teachers that I'm writing about, um, the concerns and how they understand that the, the highest aims of their vocation is, is not, is, is, is inconsistent with the kind of models of what constitutes effective or good teaching. And there's consistently all of these um, tensions between, you know, what's widely accepted around what needs to be done and what needs to be prioritized in terms of effective teaching in the classroom and the larger, much more expansive political vision that these teachers and their students many times are coming to education with the expectation about what it is that they're actually working at and what their mission is. And I, I hear some, I understand the questions in the back and forth, but I just feel like there's multiple conversations happening at all yeah. times. Yeah. And yeah. No, I, I, I wanted to come back to this because I loved what you said about the, the sort of collective set apart ethical vision, right, of, of, of black education and, and I, and it struck me, I mean, what you were, what I, what I think you were picturing in, in, in uh, putting it that way was there's a, there's a history of collective engagement with, with the difficulties, with the challenges, and of developing um, a, a collective practices and, a, and an ethical vision of what you're doing with those practices. So the practices of resistance of building alternative institutions. So when, when we develop these cases and then bring, you know, bring different people together in analyzing the cases, I take it we're trying to cultivate with that 
a kind of quality of ethical judgment that's sensitive to the nuances of, of real life cases. But you're describing a history of people not reading cases, but d dealing directly, right, with the kinds of experiences that we heard this morning. Teachers here, <laughs> studying here, have been trying to bring into the writing of cases for others to learn from, right? So what I'm, what I'm hearing between the different speakers here is that's a, that's a vision of a collective development, of a kind of collective wisdom in being able to make good judgments about how to move practice forward in a way that doesn't make the errors that people were subjected to. It's very different, Jala, from what you referred to in the social sciences and normative um, disciplines peeling apart, right? That's a more, that's a vision at a very different scale, right, of us needing bodies of knowledge and bodies of, of ethical thought and educating people in those in a way that comes together, right? So any, so that's my thought on how some of these things we're talking about here in, in your talks related, but thoughts about that? Well, I guess the part about jumping to the, the concerns about moving practice forward, moving practice forward is that I feel like there's another, there, I still think there's a kind of a pre-conversation before the moving practice forward, moving practice forward towards what ends. And I think that raising the question of how do we account for with, uh, account for a kind of diversity of ends that are at play um, is, I, I, I just feel like raises a set of, um, of, of concerns, right? When I think about the teachers that I'm, that I'm writing about, Effective teaching practices are important, yes, moving those things forward, but even before getting to that set of conversation, there's a kind of political clarity about what it actually is that we're here to do anyway. Mm -hmm. um, before we get to a conversation about effective teaching practices and moving practices forward towards particular ends, so on and so forth, that I think raises a number of ethical questions um, at the very, you know, in, in, in that kind of space, before we even get to a set of questions about moving practice forward. And, I'm, and I guess I'm trying to figure out where we have a conversation about, about that. Yeah. Is, is, the, is the thought that we need to know, um, you know, the effective for what question? The sort of, so like, mm -hmm. in the, the, one of the things that it seems like the teachers you profiled were effective for is effective for um, building a movement, effective for um, enabling um, a kind of uh, intellectual emancipation, maybe. Mm -hmm. And we often think of effectiveness now in terms of like a much narrower set of outcomes. Mm -hmm. And so, so in my understanding, you write that you want to sort of expand that space and make that a part of the conversation as well. Like, what what are the what are the aims uh, f by virtue of which uh, educational practices should be assessed? I think that's a, I, I do think that's a big question. Yeah, that one of the questions that I think is important to have on the table and to consider. Uh, yes, I would say yes. Is that but it, but it, it, were you saying something different than that? I just want to try to understand. Mm hmm. There's a, there's a question about that, but then there's also a question about education as an inherently political project mm -hmm. that, and when I'm thinking about the teachers that are thinking about they're doing work and it's in, in relationship to movement, it's always in relationship to struggle, it's never not a part of that, um, that if we, it, and that they have a political, a sense of clarity about right, the kind of larger kind of field of what, that, that is shaping the meaning of what effective teaching is, is not fully accounting for what they understand to be the most pressing matters in the world and in their lives. I just feel like how do we deal with that disjuncture that continu continuously happens, for example. And yes, and there are lots of cases in terms of 
how this comes up in different ways in the history, not just of black education, history of indigenous education, history of kind of working class students and folks like that um, in the context of the society that we live in. But for instance, if we're thinking about, you know, effective teaching is about, you know, trying to um, address the kind of material needs of students. So in the early 20th century, that means teaching them and giving them an education that's gonna allow them to be more effective workers based on the kind of roles that are made available to them and therefore effective teaching means not teaching Latin and Greek, like that teacher who founded a school who's then fired from the school that he's teaching at, because that's not moving effective teaching forward based on the kind of what's read as in the best needs of these students based on the material circumstances. But you have black teachers who are saying, we're trying to teach not based on the world that currently exists before a world that doesn't exist yet, right? And that those things are at odds with one another, right? Teaching civics, makes no sense to some people for people who are disenfranchised. But teaching civics to students who are then gonna go out in the world and say they need to have access to the, to the franchise and be treated as equal citizens, for them is effective teaching even if it doesn't have direct application in their lives in that moment. Um, and I'm just wondering like how do we, it's hard for me to get to a place of thinking about these set of protocols and practices without dealing with the realities that there are some fundamental tensions um, when it comes to the political motivations that people bring to the teaching profession, to going to school to get an education, right, in service of what? There are lots of competing ideas around that. How does the field of education ethics account for those competing visions of justice that are always on the table, always at play? Yeah, I mean, one of the things that was in the background of one of the examples that I gave, like, um, you know, should we take for granted sort of um, bourgeois norms of decorum that students are going to have to navigate in the workplace as it currently is, um, is that sort of, is, is teaching with that in mind a way of um, preparing students, especially students who come from disadvantaged backgrounds, um, to, to cope better with the world that they're gonna encounter than they otherwise would be able to do? Or is that in some way sort of surrendering or, or even in some cases I've heard the charge being complicit with mm -hmm. uh, the injustice of um, these mores continuing to be um, so prevalent. Um, and I, so, so this is one of the places where I feel really conflicted because I do think, uh, of course it feels really compromised to say, um, yeah, yeah, it's, 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 it's bad that things are as they are, but there are students in this classroom and we also have to prepare them to get by as well as they can in the world that they're actually gonna inhabit. So it, it, it seems like it matters a lot whether sort of the better world that we wanna educate for is on the horizon or is a kind of distant possibility. And this, this feels like, again, like a very compromised position to be in, but I do think that this is a question. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah. I was just gonna say that that example connects to my point that ethical reflection and skilled practice should go together, right? So, um, you know, I, I know schools where they, um, which would take one side of the dilemma that Gina brought up and would, you know, not prepare students of color for majority white settings. I know schools that would teach code switching and then I also know schools that would explain the history of the injustice, help students understand the history and the context that they're working in, express outrage, and still teach them some things that they would need to say to function in a majority white college environment. And so that is an, a stance that's informed by a lot of complex ethical thinking, which mm -hmm. you could disagree with, but it's also a stance that's informed by a lot of complex practical thinking. They've, they've, they've uh, um, enlarged the boundaries of the possibilities by thinking about different things that they could do and as, as such may have landed in a better ethical place. So that's sort of why I'm arguing that those things should be sort of developing in concert. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that, and that, that there's a idea, way of we can engage in some of this work. And I think the best in the tradition, at least that I write about and that I see, are teachers who have you know, this political clarity that it's a long, and that there's a long game and there's a short game, and that you can think about 
preparing students and equipping them with resources to navigate the social context that they're in, but always prioritizing, making sure that they don't, that you don't develop a kind of um, this, this sense of being content with the kind of order as it is, but understanding that the larger goals of what it is that they're doing is about social transformation and being very unapologetic in that political clarity. Um, and so I, I do think that it's a, it's a question of, you know, of both, both and, but one of the things that becomes complicated is when I think about ethics and the kind of oversight of structures and things that ends up happening is that, for instance, when we think about the role of kind of <coughs> social reformers and philanthropists who then kind of are only interested in the kind of immediate material circumstances that you do it, it's, this is what effective teaching is because this is what's demanded based on the kind of current kind of order of things and this is about a matter of efficiency, right? This Latin and this, or this kind of higher intellectual development is not appropriate for people who are gonna be just farmers here, right? And th whereas certainly black folks, were, these folks that I'm writing about are able to think about having it, you know, you know, go along to get along and do what's necessary in the here and now, but always thinking ahead about something else. And how do we make space for, you know, accounting for, for both of those things? I do think that it's possible, but um, I, I think it is possible. And I think that that is, you know, what y'all said. I think this is a, it's an effective and kind of meaningful acts of, of, of teaching. But I think there are ways in which those efforts become undermined with other kind of structural factors that become embedded in systems that oversee like the processes of education. Yeah. Um, and those sorts of tensions I think are always uh, informed by other kinds of you know, non-ideal aspects of the society that we live in, imbalances of power that exist that structure these contexts. Um, and I guess how do we account for that is also, also becomes another question that I'm thinking about even as we're having this, con this exchange. Yeah. Wonderful. I we should, we should, I'm sorry, I hate to cut this off, but we should give the audience three minutes to collect themselves and then go to Q&A. All right, thank you all. It's really wonderful. Cool. Yeah. No, 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 we're not over. No, you, you talk among yourselves. Greet your neighbor and uh, get ready to th formulate your questions and go to the mics. Hi, I'm Laura DeLimpio. I'm a philosopher of education at the University of Birmingham. Um, I really enjoyed the contributions on this panel. I had a question about ideal theory. So I know we haven't really defined it, but I was just wondering, I liked this idea that you're playing with the idea of we've got to consider the short-term and long-term goals. And isn't there a room for ideal theory? So let's say we're going to be really inspired and we set an aspiration and we might know we might not get there, and, but it's something to work towards and it gets us closer. And I was just thinking, the students in the class, for instance, they know it's a non-ideal world. Like, they're not stupid. They're existing in the world. They're living out there, experiencing all of this and at home. And so is there a space, do you think, for being a, a bit more idealistic about our theories, which might have a role for aspiration that we move towards? To anyone. Yeah, so I, I guess I would want to distinguish ideal theory from theory that uses ideals. And, and what I heard you just describe is, is there a place for thinking about the ideals that we should be aspiring towards? And, and I think absolutely, I feel like even in the conversations that we've had, I mean, so some of the ideals that I've heard uh, are about building a kind of justificatory community where students know how to exchange reasons and they can recognize the value of doing that. Uh, reciprocity, um, fairness, those, are, those strike me as ideals that um, we can use and we can use sort of in the context of thinking about um, 
reparative work. So, so we live in an environment where in those, we're very deficient with respect to having realized those ideals, and we can think about sort of what's the path to do better, given that it's probably not linear, and given that we're going to incur trade-offs across those ideals on the sort of the road to reparation or the road to correcting our deficiency in those ideals. So that still strikes me as a, a question and what, and again, and I, I don't, I have no interest in sort of like maintaining any kind of strict sense of these terms, but that's a question still in non-ideal theory. It's just a question about how we make things better um, in a way that is guided by ideals that we can justify to other people. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that ability to be justified to other people is itself one of the ideals. So, so I think absolutely yes, but I wouldn't necessarily say that that's um, um, I in disagreement. Oh, yeah, yeah. Does that seem right to you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, to pick up on what Gina is saying, I mean, I, I agree that I, ideals are critical. I mean, ideals give people hope, energy, um, when I started doing a, a book project I was working on and for a year I went around and talked about the project and I said, do you know like how bad things are out there? Like, so let's change. And I learned over time, like, no, no. Like briefly how bad things are out there. And then some examples of where people have done better things and connect those things and give people some hope. So uh, clearly ideals are important. I think where I think there may be a difference is this is not the only way that philosophy proceeds, and um, my f philosophical knowledge ends with, you know, some classes I took in the first year of graduate school after college. So professional philosophers should feel free to collect me. But, you know, there was just a lot of debate over, um, you know, like which principles should we ultimately aim for ideally, and um, so should it be fairness or care or egalitarianism or sufficiency or so on and so forth. And I think in, in actual situations, often there are ways to meet more than one of those goals. And I think that for the most part, people don't, practical people don't reason by virtue of like, you know, trying to resolve those questions at 10,000 feet and then coming back down to the particular case. They look at the case, they think about the values that are important to them, and then they try to figure out the way through that sort of maximizes the values that they care about and minimizes the, the values that are. Um, so in, in, in that sense, I, I think the sort of most idealized version of how you might debate ideal theory, I think, is not helpful. But um, having some ideals, I do think, is helpful. Great. Good. So I, I appreciate this conversation. Um, uh, John Wilson. Um, <laughs> thank you. Uh, appreciate this conversation. Um, the most exciting point in it to me was uh, that back and forth between Gina and Jarvis. Um, and I believe the challenge of educational ethics is to go there. Because if you can get that right, then I, I think we're there. Um, when I present last night, I shared a quote from, from Bill Gates, who said his biggest regret in coming out of Harvard was he was completely blind to the inequities and the injustice in the world. And I let everybody know that I came out of Morehouse completely aware of what he was blind to. Educational ethics is about that. And what I saw you two trying to figure out is how to reconcile that. And if you do it, Mira, if you do it, <laughs> then I think, I think Harvard is going to be rewarded and the Harvard that, that um, that this place becomes will be very different from the Harvard I attended. Word. I, mean, I, I just want to make that yeah. question. I mean, no, I, I what think, do you think? <laughs> I feel like it's in part connected to the first question as well in some ways, and it, or maybe not, maybe I, or maybe I was just thinking about where my mind went in relationship to the first question, but I think it's connected to this, is that you know, a couple of years ago, Vanessa Siddle Walker gave a talk here. Uh, she, Vanessa Siddle Walker is also a historian, writes about the important work 
of the professional organizations that black teachers created um, that were kind of undermined with the rolling out of desegregation. One of the things that I've always found to be useful about her work and what it's taught me about black teachers is that they always, at least the, the best of, among them in the historical tradition, um, if we're thinking of these as the people that would have been the educators of so, all of the civil rights leaders that we love to celebrate, right, that didn't just fall out of the sky, but who were the products of educational environments somewhere, right, that they, you know, where they um, kind of acquired these dreams that they were working to enact in the world, is that they were offered an education that gave them a set of ideals to kind of hold on to and aspire to while also being given space to develop an, an incisive social analysis about the non-ideal circumstances in which they were living, right? But that you don't, but in learning about the non-ideal circumstances in which you're living, you don't have to be reduced to that or under, understand yourself only in relationship to that because you have like a, a set of ideals that you're able to aspire to, that you're also taught that you are worthy of, right? And that you deserve and that you should also demand. Um, but having one without the other, I do think, you know, runs the risk of setting um, students up, all students in particular, but, you know, certain students are more vulnerable than others when it comes to, like, not having access to both of those things, um, you know, at a disadvantage, right? What I mean, you know, not having the kind of ideals to look to can mean that you only, you know, have the kind of non-ideal circumstances around you to uh, understand, you know, things about the world with, right, it doesn't help you to aspire, right, to anything more than that, but not having a, a, an incisive social analysis about the world around you mean that you can become, you're blind to the reality that you're living in and living kind of in an alternate reality in some ways until you're forced to confront it um, without having the kind of resources to equip yourself with how to handle and navigate those things. And so I think it was always a both end, both a kind of having some facility of both, you know, being able to have a set of ideals to work towards and aspire towards. I mean, the entire freedom, you know, black freedom struggle. Woke up, my, woke up this morning with my mind on freedom, right? You don't have freedom in the world, but your mind is on something that you're working towards. And it's the same model that we see embodied in the kind of pedagogical models of black teachers who are teaching black students to aspire, but also giving them language to name the injustices and the non-ideal conditions around them. And that's what constituted good teaching for black people, allowing students to reach a place to have a political clarity about those things and an ability to understand the difference between the ideal and the non-ideal, and to have the confidence to be able to move between thinking about both of them without feeling demoralized, because you have to be equipped with something that allows you to move through it um, and to aspire to something more. Um, and that's, one, that's part of something that I think, you know, that folks like Vanessa Siddle Walker and other folks have talked about that was kind of undermined and lost with the gutting of the kind of teaching traditions that did, you know, do some work well, do a lot of that work well in terms of supporting the kind of, in cultivating the leadership of the kind of, the leaders that came through the kind of first um, uh, you know, half of the, the 20th century um, that, you know, and, and we haven't necessarily done a good job of studying and naming those things and holding that up as models of effective teaching or justice-oriented teaching, right? Um, and I think there are certain contemporary models that lean really heavily into the non-ideal part and they're missing, you know, a lot of, you know, the other things. And I, this is part of the reason why that language of anti-racism is something I don't, I think is inconsistent with the best model of black teaching because you name the things that are not good in society but to, but to define your entire purpose through a negation, right, is, it, it, it's demoralizing. Um, we, yeah. We have to give the last three minutes to Sandy Levinson. <laughs> yeah, Sandy Levinson, University of Texas Law School. Um, I wanna pick up on Jarvis's talk which I found extraordinarily interesting, <clears throat> um, partly because you emphasized at the beginning of the talk the element of illegality. And in terms of ethics or civic education, it seems to me very, very important to differentiate between law and ethics. And at times to point out that 
an ethical life requires disobedience to law. Mm -hmm. And so quite frankly, um, if there were more time last night, I would have questioned President Wilson on the issue of veneration for the Constitution, because it does seem to me that if one looks, say, at Frederick Douglass, that one has an extraordinarily complicated biography there with regard to his views about the Constitution. You, mm -hmm. you can quote him on all sides, but this is a person, after all, who defended the killing of federal marshals who were complicit with the fugitive slave law and who gave, ironically enough, his greatest speech, pro-Constitution speech, while he was in exile in the UK because he plausibly could have been indicted for, for being a co-conspirator with John Brown. So even if one wants to push the Constitution, perhaps one should not push the authority of the Supreme Court to separate very sharply <laughs> the two. But it does seem to me in all seriousness, if one is talking about the actual lived classroom experience of mm -hmm. teachers today facing crazy school boards mm -hmm. like in mm -hmm. Texas mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and really having to walk on eggshells about what it is you teach the young, in some ways it seems almost easier to teach them ethical theory than to confront the issue of legal obligation mm -hmm. Hmm. beginning with the extraordinary material that you presented at the beginning, for which I'm exceedingly grateful, and I can't wait to read your book. Great. Thanks. That was helpful for me. Thank you. Fabulous. I think that was not a question. <laughs> <laughs> and so, uh, but thank you for that. And let's thank this brilliant panel. Yeah, it's really good. Yeah.